So welcome to this event in the Raising Peace Festival. And it's a particular pleasure that we've got lots of people here with deep experience of working peace and justice in this session. And I was very excited as I was watching the names of people registering for this one as they were coming in. Because um, I think it's an important thing for all of us to think about where, how, how, our, how we're mentally placed when we're doing this work. I'm talking to you from Wongal and Gadigal country here in Sydney, and I acknowledge that this is unceded land that was taken from the First Nations people by force. As we all know from last year's referendum, the work of reconciliation and justice is unfinished, and it's a continuing burden for us all, and especially for First Nations people. I acknowledge the work of past and present First Nations elders to remove this burden and welcome any First Nations people who are on today's call. Um, you're welcome to acknowledge where you're um, meeting us from today in the chat. Uh, today's workshop, and it is a workshop and it should be fun, uh, is hosted by Professor Winifred Lewis from the Social Change Lab at the University of Queensland. Winifred studied psychology and socio-cultural anthropology at the University of Toronto uh, before doing higher studies in decision-making in conflict and um, at McGill University. And she came to the University of Queensland in 2001. So she's definitely got her uh, koala badge in that time. Um, having discovered Australia, she ended up applying for and getting a job here and has progressed through um, the ranks of the university, so she is now a full professor there uh, since 2018. Um, her research concerns the antidecence of political and social behaviour, with a specific focus on the choices of conflict tactics, collective action and the expression of prejudice. And you can read more about her work and the resources that they've developed at their website socialchangelab.net and we can put that in in the chat later so you can see that of particular interest to us is her work to map peace organizations across queensland and potentially australia and she might say more about that um, she's been an activist for more than 30 years supporting human rights the environment unions the survivors of sexual and domestic violence and anti-racism uh, winifred is a member of just peace queensland and wilf uh, and the uh, Psychologists for Peace interest group of the Australian Psychologi Psychological Society. Um, I will leave it to Winifred to introduce more about today's workshop, which will run until half past eight Sydney time. So that's 90 minutes. Uh, Winifred, welcome and thank you. It's been a long time coming that we've been um, wanting to uh, do something with you. Thank you so much, James, um, and thank you to everyone for making time today. It's really such a pleasure. I'm so excited um, to share with you and to hear what and uh, you guys have to say and learn from you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the psychology of effective peace building, but I want to also, as James did, begin with an acknowledgement of country. And um, so I wanted to say, as James did, that, you know, we're all joining um I think all of us are Australians, but perhaps not. Please post in the chat um, where you're from if you have time and uh, you feel comfortable. But um, we're all joining here on uh, in Australia on a profoundly um, problematic definition of peace. So uh, Martin Luther King, many decades ago, said peace is not just the absence of tension. It's the presence of justice. And so peace building is not just about bringing an end to um, war and violence, but bringing an end to structural inequality, to structural violence, as Galton said. And um, in Australia, one of the, the foundational injustices of our country was the dispossession of Aboriginal people. And here in Brisbane, on Mianjin, on Yagara and Turbal country, um, we're, we're starting this workshop and I hope that um, we can all together take steps towards a peaceful and just Australia. Um, so I want to um, just tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk for about 15 or 20 minutes. Some of you would have heard this content before, but I actually only recognized one or two names. So I think a lot of you will not have uh, maybe approached the psychology of effective peace building um, with our lab before. And then I'm going to go through an individual exercise, which is just about five minutes, which will hopefully bring everyone 
into a personal experience of reflection on this topic. And then there's a series of small group uh, and individual activities. If we have time, there are five activities all up. So um, yeah, I really welcome though going off track. And um, I am an activist of 30 years, including 20 years in the Australian peace movement. And so I know that when you have, um, let's, just, let's see, 16 participants in a peace seminar, you have 17 points of view. <laughs> I welcome our conversations. All right, um, so let me just quickly take you through some content. And um, Paloma, you'll let me know if there's anything in the chat I need to know before. I'm not gonna read the chat till we get to our activities. So one, um, one comment, of course, is that when we're talking about social change towards a peaceful Australia, there's actually a lot that would change. It's not just a state of mind. It's not just a psychology or, or a state of relationships. Um, our, our economy would change. Um, many of us are very well aware of the AUKUS Treaty, which devotes, you know, $368 billion um, to a particular project, just one set of instruments of war. So our whole economy would change and our political uh, debates would change. And our the way that we educate children in school would change and our relationships to the world would change. So we're really talking about a profound transformation that will take decades. And of course, when we imagine a peaceful world, many of us don't stop at the boundaries of Australia. We imagine a world where um, there is no violence um, looking across the other countries. So that kind of change is almost unimaginable to most people. And one of the things that people often ask me is, you know, why psychologists? <laughs> well, we have imagination. No, um, psychologists deal with identity and relationships and social norms. And so that's the, the lens through which we're going to spend some time today to look at this challenging problem. So if we take a step back from that social change, from the lifestyle change um, to the, the bipartisan support for peace that would have to develop for our infrastructure and mass production systems to change, we can see that there would be community groups and early adopters that would take on these ideas. And before then, there would be, you know, scientists, inventors, artists, and if I can get my animation to work, activists. Um, so activists, in fact, come in usually at the beginning of social change. And as they are more and more mainstream, there are other people that come in, particularly um, industrial and political leaders that end up doing the work. And if we imagine responding to climate change, you can already see that as the world response to climate change develops, there are more and more corporate actors, more and more mainstream political actors that are coming in. So part of what we're imagining as activists is that we're going to be handing over our job to other people. But what is it that will allow us to do that? Because what will allow us to see that opinion leaders and opportunists are seizing the peace agenda and trying to run with it? And so part of the rationale for this line of work, let me see if I can get rid of this meeting controls, is that um, as I started to study effective activism, I found actually that backlashes could re readily be demonstrated in laboratory research. And of course, we've all seen them in our personal activism. So sometimes some activists communicate as if the other um, folks have a united negative norm, and that can actually be counterproductive. So in some of my early studies on racism, I was using messages such as, um, you know, Australia is the most racist country in the world. That was something that an activist said at the time in an, in an anti-racism campaign. And I explored the effects of statements like that. And as you would expect, it was actually negative because when um, ordinary people or students read messages like that, they actually endorsed more racist views. So I thought that was fascinating. Another backlash effect that I demonstrated was when activism would actually make your opponents more hostile to you. <laughs> so um, a stigmatizing negative message would make your opponents feel more distant from you, more aware of their own conflicting identity, perhaps, you know, right wing or left wing or rural or urban. And they would um, polarize away and actually increase the behavior that was trying to be challenged. Another backlash effect that's been found in psychology is when an attack will actually credential opponents so it could make them look like they're tough or legitimate leaders because they've been attacked. And we could talk about some of these things if you're interested in, and I'm happy to um, help you guys find readings. 
but I'm going to focus on what works in this talk. Don't worry, we're just going to spend a few minutes on this backlash. And then the, the fourth way that we um, psychologists and others have found that an activist can um, actually undermine their cause is when agents of change and allies are um, delegitimized. And so this is actually very common in our Westminster political system where um, it's very difficult to cooperate. We have an adversarial tradition of politics. And so the idea is that, you know, instead of environmentalists being able to work together across the aisle to effect change, each one has to savagely attack the other as unrealistic or, you know, um, ineffective half measures and so on. And of course, going along with all of four of those things is making adherence to the movement ideology a partisan issue. So when we say, you know, it's only people from Victoria that feel like this or only people in the left wing that feel like this, that'll actually reduce the likelihood of change. OK, so fine, there's some backlash effects that we can demonstrate. What do we do about that? Um, well, what we tried to do in a book um, from Cambridge Uni Press is lay out some of the ways in which activism can be effective, some of the goals that it can achieve, focusing on the psychological level and thinking ahead to policy changes and system change. And so this is another of these academic texts, you know, very ugly and wordy and very expensive. Um, so if you are interested in it, please reach out to me um, so that the the cost of the book doesn't need to be an issue. And then what we what we presented in that book is a framework we call Abiasca. And at the end of this 20 minute talk, I'm going to upload a resource um, which has the key ideas as a two page word file. So some of you guys might be taking notes and that's fabulous, but I just wanted to let you know that I'm also gonna give you a summary of the key principles. So one issue in Abiasca is that it, the reason why it's so difficult to come to a consensus on whether a given tactic is effective is because there are so many different audiences that um, greet any particular um, peace activity. So here today, we're actually probably quite a homogenous group. I expect that almost everyone in the audience will be prepared to say, yes, I'm a peace activist. I am actually interested in that. So if you guys are willing to identify as a peace activist, please just put in the chat, yes, I am a peace activist. There may be some people that are supporters of peace, but not active, and I'll speak about them in a second. So when we talk about the self in Abiasca, we're really talking about activists talking to themselves. And one impact of an action is that it can empower and inspire, or it can demoralize the collective actors themselves. Then there are the supporters of a cause and the opponents of a cause. You know, hardly anyone opposes peace per se. We have some data in Queensland that show that more than 90% of Queenslanders oppose, for example, invasions. Um, that's not surprising. We, we always see that. But when we focus on specific wars and specific military principles, that's where we can see some people might support the AUKUS Treaty and some people might oppose it. And of course, there are bystanders that haven't made a commitment either way, often because they do not know uh, what it is. So when we ask about what do you think about Ukraine, for example, Many people might say, well, I don't know, you know, haven't heard about, it. I don't know, not perhaps now after two years of the con combat, but in the in the first month. And then we talk about third parties and third parties are people committed to other agendas. So the most important ones for activists um, that are well studied are the media and the policymakers. So, for example, um, the media has to make a profit and attract readers to their newspapers or viewers to their online um, content. And then policymakers want to be reelected. And of course, there are bureaucrats that want to be paid and, and so on. So we can think about all these audiences. We can think about an effect in the immediate, the short and medium term and the long term. And the reason why that's important is because the same activity can be viewed differently, not just by different audiences, but at the time and later. So when we look back, for example, on the Vietnam rallies, our opinion is not what people would have thought at the time. You know, oftentimes in the short term, opinions are very variable. And in the longer term, people come to a more consensus um, view, usually because of narratives that develop within the movement or the media. And of course, it's the case that um, sometimes people just forget about action. So, you know, a particular rally might not be remembered the next year by anyone except the people that were there. Okay. 
Now, I don't want to talk for too long, and I've already talked for longer than I anticipated. Um, so we're going to charge through what the psychological research says about how to achieve the goals of a particular action for an audience. So I might, um, for example, in this talk, be focused on other activists. But what am I trying to do with you? Why am I here? Why are you here? And so one of the common ways that activists interact with each other is in terms of awareness raising, especially education. So yesterday I went to a great talk about AUKUS by David Shoebridge, just laying out um, a really interesting analysis. And that kind of education serves a purpose of raising awareness. So the ABIASCA acronym, the first letter is A for awareness raising. Now, psychology tells us some of the things that work for awareness raising, not just education and expertise-based advocacy, but also stunts and celebrities. So when Leonardo DiCaprio made an announcement about climate change that reached 360 million people in one tweet, when um, Taylor Swift uh, weighed in on the American election, you know, celebrities can play a huge role um, for awareness raising. And then the next step um, is building sympathy. So um, what we know from psychology is that if people have awareness without sympathy, it is usually because there's a lack of trust. So if I might know, for example, that some people are demonstrating against the COVID vaccine, but I'm not sympathetic to their cause because I don't see them as trusted sources and the underpinning of trust. Uh, and again, we can say a lot more for people that are interested is credibility liking and morality. So those are the three pillars that lead to trust that activists need to try and communicate to their audiences about. Um, if you have sympathy for a cause and you haven't taken action, you're not a bad person, right? Um, so the example I often use is aged care. M many of us probably have a very strong view that aged care in Australia should be improved and that the conditions of degradation in some um, elderly uh, people's experiences in late life are shameful. And so the question is, what might you have done about that in the last six months? And for many people, the answer will be nothing. But it's not because there's a lack of sympathy. So when people have sympathy and they don't have intentions to act personally, they are usually um, needing these four things. The norms of people like me, people like me are taking this action. And that can come when you're invited to participate by people in your networks. Incentives and capacity building to make it easy to act. You know, what should I do about aged care? It seems like an intractable problem. Sign this petition. Okay, I'll do that. Donate to this cause. Okay, I'll do that. And then, of course, reducing costs and barriers. And we could talk about these. And then um, if you have an intention and you don't act, um, this often comes from you know, those four things we just talked about, but also a sense of relevance and timing, right? So I, the fact that I have an, in, an intention to act on aged care, right? What will allow me to actually do that now? Making it easy, creating a scaffolding or pathway to that action, often shared through personal testimonies and then removing the barriers. Okay, so we, again, we can spend a whole hour on this, but we're not going to. So those four things are called mobilization and they're studied in politics, they're studied in psychology and they're studied in sociology. And then in politics and in policy studies, we look at the long-term system and social change. And as a psychologist of social change, I kind of focus on three aspects of this. The first is sustaining your motivation in the longer term. I've been a peace activist for more than 20 years in Australia, more than 30 years in my life. And in all that time, we have not taken substantive steps, you know, to achieve world peace. We have taken steps, but we are not close, you know, to world peace. We have to sustain our motivation, perhaps not just through decades, but through lifetimes. You know, how do we do that as individually and as a group? And how do we face those setbacks? There's a huge literature on this in psychology and in business studies as well. It's the same as burnout in the workplace. So a sense of belonging, um, skill building, recognition, small wins, social events. You know, there's a effective tactics to build that motivation and sustain us when we face failure and challenge. We also have a challenge of scaling up from our existing groups 
to new groups to support peace. Now, this is where I feel the peace movement in Australia and elsewhere is struggling. Um, not so much now with Gaza, where a, a younger generation has come in, but oftentimes when we do look at rooms of people like this later on when we take our videos and share screens with each other, oftentimes it's quite an old group when we talk about peace activists. So we need to branch out from the demographics that are narrow to other demographics. We need to connect in with um, corporations and businesses. We need to create what we call in psychology cross-cutting identities that connect people. So in the same way that a religion might connect people from all different ethnic groups and cities or all around the country, we have to imagine a movement that's effective, that has this huge coalition um, that has people coming together. And then there's how we manage uh, the risk of opposition. So, um, you know, having change at the center, not just on the extremes, um, having networks outside the conflict context that can connect people. Again, we can say a lot more about this um, when energy permits. So all of these are interconnected with each other. And when we say we want to set a goal, for example, as a movement of building a broader coalition or managing pushback, you know, that involves oftentimes many actions that we are trying to communicate with each other about, raise awareness and intentions and sympathy, but also this can be huge goals like world peace. So you can see how um, useful it is, but also how challenging it is to imagine the audiences, the timeframes and the goals. So the ABIASCA acronym is um, awareness raising, building sympathy, intentions, action, sustaining the groups over time and the motivation over time, coalition building and avoiding or managing the risks of opposition. And so what I'm going to invite you guys to do, if you've got your um, phones there or another um, screenshot, just take a screenshot of this uh, particular screen, and then we're going to head into an activity. I'll take some questions, and then we're going to head into an activity where you reflect on peace actions you've taken and what goals they had and what audiences they had. <laughs> Not an easy task. Okay, so I'm going to assume that interested people have done that. And I'm going to say, you know, many of us might have engaged in a heap of actions. Um, if when I'm asking you to think about three actions, you know, try and make them diverse. So it could be a rally. It could be an event like today. It could be the day of peace in 2024 and so on. And what you'll be doing in the first activity, which I want to do in only five minutes, is think about three actions and identify what were some of the audiences, what was the time frame that the action was oriented to, and what were the goals that the action was trying to do. And if you feel like you've got time in those five minutes, you could even say, was that were they evidence-based? Okay, so I'm going to um, leave this up during the activity, but before I do that, I'm just going to stop sharing for a second, and I'm going to um, have a quick look at the chat in a moment, but I'm also going to upload a file um, that I'd like everyone to to... Uh, download it well if you want to which is a summary of the evidence and the the principles that underpin effectively engaging each goal so i've just put it in the chat there it says abby ask a re resource it's a two-pager and um please feel free to email me at the email they're given after this event if you want to elaborate because you can already see how we're going to run out of time right Okay, let me quickly scan and see how many activists um, we're willing to identify. That's good. Yeah. Actually, not everyone. Um, so I welcome everyone. And if you're not a peace activist, so much the better. Um, you know, you're welcome here. And um, of course, the same principles apply to all the movements we're involved in. Most of us are involved in many different movements. Um, okay, so before we get into the first activity, I let's have some questions and feel free to type them into the chat. Um, feel free also to, um, you know, just unmute and go ahead and ask. We're a small group here, so I'm, I'm happy. And if, if I spoke um, so quickly, you're still processing what I said in the third minute, that's okay too. <laughs> Let me scroll through here and see. Um, this is a, a workshop where if you're not willing to do any work, it will make the workshop less effective for others. But what we'll do is get a sense, um, Paloma, 
um, when we're in the small groups, if some of the small groups are populated by um, kind of silent figures, <laughs> that's just one real person, <laughs> that's okay. Okay, so the first activity, which I'm gonna share the screens um, for, is to just jot down the three actions. So let me just go back into the um, PowerPoint and I'll show you um, what I had in mind in terms of the notes page that you could work from. So um, what you might look at doing is have a look at those three activities, either on your screen or perhaps verbally, if you're um, with other people, just um, talk it over. And then what time frame the effects were supposed to be for and um, what the audiences were. And oftentimes there's more than one, but maybe if you've in the first instance, pick the key audience and then what the goal was. So for example, was it a, about education or awareness raising? Or were the events actually trying to let people mobilize to take action? And if so, what? Uh, or were they trying to get all the way to policy change? And did they map onto any of these um, goals, sustaining motivation across time and in the face of failure, building coalitions and avoiding counter mobilization? So we're just right now at, um, let me just check the time. Let's see. Yeah, we're just right now at 7.30. Um, so I'd like to um, spend no more than five minutes. I'm going to call you straight back. Um, sorry, I'm alt-tabbing, aren't I? That's no good. I'm going to call you straight back at 7.45, uh, 7.35. And if you could just take some time now to jot down um, some actions, that would be good. And I'm just going to do the same myself um, for a number of reasons, including if we end up with hardly any real participants. <laughs> we may need something to talk about, right? Okay, so I'm jotting down my own actions now and I hope you are doing the same. All right, I hope everyone's had a chance to jot down a couple of activities, at, at least one or two and maybe three and maybe think about what audiences are involved and what time frame, and what um, goals were generated, if any. One of the things that I want you to realize, or I expect that you will realize immediately, is that many of the, t the activities that we participate in, there's not a consensus on the audience's goals or time frame. And so in the next small group discussion, and um, which I've said here is going to be five minutes, but um, I think it depends on the group. It's likely to be more like 10. Um, what I imagine that you'll do is you'll share the activities um, that you came up with and what you wrote down about each of them. So each person might spend a minute talking about the activities that they had. And please do try and keep it uh, very brief. And then you might think, OK, um, are we all thinking of activities that target the same audiences? Are there some that are really being well served? Are there some that are being missed? Is there a good spread across short, medium and long term? oriented activities or is there a focus on the short term um, and what are the goals that are being addressed are there you know a spread of goals is it some more than others are there goals that are neglected so I'd like you to spend let's say 10 minutes on that and so what Paloma is going to do now is she's going to divide our group of um, 17 minus three organizers so into three groups and Paloma if you could randomize that'd be good um, Absolutely. I'll do that now. Yeah. And then just take 10 minutes to go through um, the questions here. And again, you may like to take a picture of this activity to slide, but maybe Paloma also will um, take a screenshot and put it in the chat. Great. Also. Um, well, welcome back, everyone. So um, I, th I hope you found that interesting. And of course, you can see that what you could do in 10 minutes, you could easily spend two hours on, especially you know, those of us that have large groups and um, we could, and that have many activities, we could spend a lot more time on that. And I hope you do, um, because I think it's worthwhile. So we, in our group, um, we're sharing a lot of awareness raising activities. I was saying um, to our group that compared to other movements, peace activism is actually very long-term. Many movements are far more short-term than we are. But still, most of our activities have a relatively short-term focus and a focus on awareness and sympathy 
without really always having um you know a, a clear plan of how to get participants and bystanders to act um was that can i have some reports back from the other two groups how, how did you guys um identify the audiences or what did you see any patterns there that you feel like you can report um i may pick on people if there aren't any volunteers yeah diane oh it's so nice to see you you have to unmute though no you have to unmute diane sorry i've just asked you to unmute so you should okay, yeah, great. I, i've unmuted sorry i don't know how i got to be muted yeah anyway uh because i was talking in the group and then I, <laughs> anyway everyone was automatically remuted when they rejoined uh thank you we keep learning um so um we we didn't get very far with our analysis because where um we had so many interesting uh different actions to to talk about and share um i would say the most um most obvious trend was how long term uh, the actions were fantastic um, and peter could you tell us your story about about the um pe people for nuclear oh no it was the palm sunday one yes <laughs> and your, your child well is he in the still in the zoom or sure, did he he's, you here. he's just uh, he's just muted. Oh, that's me sorry there we go. Sorry, I have a photograph of taken when uh, our forty-two-year-old son was about six weeks old, and we took him on a Palm Sunday march. <laughs> so that gives an idea of how long-term things have been churning. <laughs> uh, of course, there have been, <clears throat> you might say the tempo has sort of increased, particularly more recently with the Palestinian, the pro-Palestinian demos that are on in Sydney. Mm. There's a lot of um there's a lot of energy there. There's a lot of uh goodwill I find. Yeah. Um <clears throat> uh, there are some at times expressions of um uh armed resistance of one or two but I don't find that they last. I, I, I see them there once every maybe four, four or five weeks and then they'll, uh, you know, they disappear and they mm. then they might come back later on. But that's certainly a very much a minority. Um, uh, I've often seen women who have newborn babies, which they're putting on display with great pride and fantastic regalia <laughs> you know, all the cultural richness of the Arabic world. Um, and you look at them and they kind of blush. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's very nice. And um, maybe when they're in their 60s and 70s, they'll be showing those pictures of their lengthy peace activism, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that particular uh, demonstration to me is, is one that more obviously transcends the, the distance of of uh, space and and land and um, uh, you know I think people are pleased when they um, when they see non Arabic people joining mm. in and expressing and I, I carry a banner which says that um, one of the groups I I walk with is uh, Pax Christi which is a Catholic peace group. And the banner says, uh, Patricia is in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Mm. And, and I get a lot of reactions from that. Yeah, I mean, so many themes in what you've said and coalition building and values-based mm. action for the longer term. I'm just curious, is there anyone that has less than five years of peace activism experience um, in the group? You can raise hands um, in the reactions. Yeah, I think we're, oh, Bernadette, so welcome. Um, we are mostly a, a pretty solid group. And I think that's the kind of person that rocks up on a Monday night to do education about tactics, right? But you are welcome, Bernadette, especially. And so just looking at the time, which is flying by as 
as it always does. I'm going to share screens again. But what I'd like to imagine we're going to do, and I'm sorry, the third group, um, I believe in the richness of your analysis. I'm just going to try and move us along, um, even though we all would like to hear from you in the um, in principle. I want um, I want to focus on um, now a quick individual reflection that will go into a small group um, on what would be an audience time frame or goal that has been neglected. So for some of us, you know, it's a source of um, kind of awe and pride to think back on the decades of personal activism that, you know, is reflected in Peter's story or um, in some of the other stories that we might have heard in our small groups. So if we turn our attention away from that, though, and think about what we would like to see change, you know, it could be a peace movement that's a hundred times bigger than it is. It could be um, a peace movement that focuses on concrete action. You know, what would be an evidence-based tactic that could be effective to address an audience, a time frame, or a goal, or all three that's been comparatively neglected? Now, as you think about this yourselves, you know, you may be thinking of what your own group could do, you know, how your own group could broaden their lens or what you could personally do, or you may have it in mind that someone else could do this, right? Not you guys. <laughs> so sometimes it's a bit easier to imagine what other people could do. Um, but if, you know, the mood strikes, um, please think about what your own group could do that would reach a new audience or address a goal that hasn't been um, well uh, canvassed in the past. So I'm going to do this alongside you, and we're only going to take um, a few minutes until 8 p.m. to do this. So if you can think of more than one evidence-based tactic, that's great. And for those that joined late, you may like to look at the two-page resource there, which looks at um, evidence-based tactics for each of the goals. So for education um, and, and awareness raising, you know, there's a value to say stunts and celebrities. Um, when we're looking at, um, you know, persuading people, um, oftentimes it's about communicating that we're moral and credible and likable. Um, so have some thought about things like that. And I'm going to do the same right now. And um, as part of that, I'll find my own pen. And then we're going to go into small groups, of course, and share these. So you'll have to be prepared to, to discuss your choices. So okay. in, in the third activity, I'm sorry, let me just share the mission brief before you uh, assign people. Um, so here we go. So in our uh, small group work here, I'm hoping, whoops, sorry. I'm hoping that... Um, you'll talk about this question of you know as we as we seek to move from awareness of the value of peace to world peace um what would be the next step that the groups could take what audiences or time frames or goals could we embrace and what evidence-based tactics could we use um, and of course we don't have to have a consensus please don't um, limit yourselves by asking everyone to agree um, but, you know, share um, the opinions. And in some cases, there is consensus. But um, as you know, in the peace movement, often we're, uh, you know, a, a rich and diverse community. Okay, um, so Paloma, if you could assign us to our small groups, and if everyone could join the small group, that would be great. Um, in this final 20 minutes, um, again, we could, we could have talked for two hours, and uh, we talked for 10 minutes. But I hope that those of you that are um, with groups, we'll take this technique back and talk for two hours with your own group. Um, because a lot of the time, you know, we have our tried and trusted paths that we have done, but actually with just 10 minutes, there were some great ideas in my small group. So I don't know if people want to share if there was anything that inspired them um, that they could do differently or that they are already doing that's different. I might start with you, Paloma, because I found your vision very inspiring. You want to just spend a couple of minutes um, talking about reaching out to young people and in groups um, yeah. like your. Absolutely. Uh, well, I was discussing sort of how groups of young people tend to look at the peace movement as adult led and they sometimes have a disillusionment um, with sort of the initiatives and the goals. Um, 
I think that there is definitely an importance in focusing on um, the demographic of young people, specifically groups of young people. As Winifred pointed out, one young person that's potentially, you know, my age, around 21 or 22, is less likely to get involved and go to a meeting where there's um, those that are 60 plus because they don't feel as though they're as represented as um, others. So I definitely think that there needs to be that focus on the groups of young people. I mean, at the moment, I'm involved in a, a leadership launch pad program with Amnesty International that specifically focuses on those between the ages of 15 to 25. Um, and there's about 80, 80 members of that group Fantastic. about human rights activis activism and real effective ways to campaign and get the word out there specifically in the social media realm um, that young people tend to be very involved in. That's right. And and all the different realms. I think um, someone in our group was talking about a choir of, of people singing sea shanties, which is very surprising to me, but apparently young people, uh, there's a new generation of people that sing sea shanties. So that's fabulous on every level. And another um, couple of audiences were parents and um business. Um, Di, did you want to speak to business? You have to unmute again, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, I, like many of us, uh, I've been campaigning for a long time. And when I came into the peace movement, we saw business as sort of the enemy, the military industrial complex, and we were kind of separate from that. Um, but as um, Winifred touched on, if we don't look at the economy, things aren't going to change as much as we'd like. Um, so for example, so I've been my, my kind of learning area at the moment in peace is um, ethical investment and uh, something strategies like market forces where mm. lots of people buy small bundles of shares in terrible companies so when if they suddenly die their children will be very shocked at their <laughs> share portfolio um, and um, then that allows you to have a say in the annual general meeting to bring up motions and to begin to structure the dialogue a bit differently. And initially I thought, oh, that's very manipulative. But the first motion that I was involved in putting up um, had uh, such a resounding endorsement. I thought, well, it was actually rather manipulative not to bring it up because there was very, very wide agreement with it but the um, sort of top level just dealt with it by never talking about it and market forces through collective action helps break through that and formulate different policies like no coal yeah and yeah and bringing our values and our ideas to new audiences exactly I can't remember who it was in our group that was talking about young couples and parents and um do, would someone like to speak to that margaret uh, you need to unmute margaret, though yes i've just sent you a notification to unmute margaret there you go uh, it was jill who was talking about that oh jill uh <laughs> oh, there she is <laughs> jill um you don't have to if you've settled back into that chair <laughs> uh, no that's all right that's okay um yeah, I was just saying that young families um, used to be, um, well, at some peace marches, young families were quite um, obvious. You know, there were lots of them, particularly the Iraq war. I was mm -hmm. amazed to see people with babies in strollers and things, you know, waiting to join the uh, anti-Iraq war, the huge rally. In fact, the rally was so huge, I ended up never going anywhere because the thing came back to the beginning before the end <laughs> had left. Um, and I just thought that they're a group that nowadays, particularly around the economy, are having great difficulty um, just making ends meet and they haven't got time or energy to really be devoting to 
things other than family. So I don't know how you um, can engage with them. It's I just see that as difficult, but important because they're parenting the next generation. Mm. Well, I guess I would say, um, you know, focusing on those evidence-based principles of intentions and actions. So do we think that the parents have intentions without action, in which case it's about scaffolding and empowering? You know, many of us sign a million petitions. That's a, a very quick way to draw people in. But they also might have sympathy without intentions. And then it comes down to things like time and resourcing and relevance. And so um, some of you guys know that middle-aged people are actually less likely to volunteer than younger and older people. And that's just because the press of their personal and professional obligations is stronger. So we have to think about how to make it relevant to their personal and professional obligations. But I think many parents actually do see that. I want to now um, invite the other guys um, in your groups to just speak quickly um, in you know one or two minutes each about new audiences, new goals, and new tactics that you discussed. And of course, if you decided they were terrible, you don't have to say. Go ahead. Um, would I'll, anyone... I'll, jump, I'll, I'll jump in because it actually springs off what was being talked about there. I mean, I had a thought which I didn't actually say in my group about about mothers, which was kind of similar. And I was reflecting on, you know, was it different in the, around the time of Vietnam when they were thinking about their sons being sent off to war? I don't know, but that mm. could have been a factor. But uh, we talked quite a lot about... Um, uh, young people and school kids in, in our group also and thinking about you know that's sort of targeting them with the, with the same sort sort of, of evidence and, and information that, that they see around 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 climate issues which are obviously and um frankly I think correctly it, it is their primary concern mm -hmm. um, but doesn't mean that there isn't room for, for peace activism as well um but also a, a really great um, suggestion for a, a group and a sort of unusual target that uh, Elizabeth put out there was the police mm. and uh, to sort of mm. you know that, 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 that police have you know an interest in in preventing you know sort of death and disorder and so on so when the police turn up turn up early we say thank goodness you're here yeah. <laughs> sort of a thing which was quite a cute idea um, and uh, yeah, and then in terms of some of the issues that have been neglected, um, Luis was bringing up the uh, the the frontier wars as sort of like one of those, Absolutely. as you were sort of alluding to in, in your opening winner for those sort of key points of, of injustice that uh, we just have not engaged with in this country and that we need to address. Yeah, and I think we've seen over the 20 years that I've been in Australia an incredible arc and a real unveiling and a refreshing of our awareness. And I think that the truth-telling commissions that people are talking about as part of the Uluru um, statement are gonna be really powerful. Here in Queensland today, um, we just started a truth-telling um, journey and and uh, we just, I'm so excited to see where it lends, but these are multi-year and sometimes multi-decade commitments. But I think we have, as Australians, we have so much to do. Um, Who's the other group? Do you guys want to also? Sorry. Yep, go on, Wendy. Yes, at the moment, can I just speak to what I just put in the chat from our group with James? Because it kind of crossed over too. Just very quickly, the ex yeah, of course. it seems so relevant. The example of rising tide and having just watched the video, which will be available on YouTube soon, and having spent the weekend with um, the middle generation person <laughs> of an intergenerational family, with a 97-year-old father, the, the middle generation person, and his daughter, who was a spokesperson in the video. So I got inspiration from that and some think, and I'm just thinking about how we could use that intergenerational within one family, even as an inspiring example, and to work, you know, what happened? How is this possible? What happened with the rising tide that's got so many young people out there? So yeah. that's what I was yeah fantastic and and intergenerational um connections with veterans as well often come into that at least in the vietnam war you know many returning veterans were part of the peace movement and um, their families spoke out really powerfully um that's something i think of um, when in response to your point but that's so great thank you um 
so we must be missing one group. Could someone from the other group please speak? Or maybe we just shrunk down. Peter, were you in the unrepresented silent group? But you might have to unmute though, sorry. Yeah. Not very, yeah. Um, well, actually, my the, the, the group that I thought was neglected in society was prisoners. Oh, yes. What a and great, I, great insight. Yes. Um, but then I was also talking about my uh, the intergenerational stuff mm. with my son. We've got, a, you know, I mentioned last time uh, having my son at the march, the police march at a few his, weeks old. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, well. I mean, the discussion sort of flowed around and away from um, from my own topic, so. Uh, okay, yeah, well, thank you for sharing. I mean, I guess um, part of what I want to do today is just raise these questions so that people will think about them afterwards, right? So when I think about the action that I want you guys to do, oh, sorry, Elizabeth, go. Just one more thing. Is it more stories about non-violence yes. that works? Yes. And the efficacy of nonviolence, like yes. Eric Kennerworth studies, all things that, you know, so people can see that there's an option. It's yes. not just war and violence. That's fantastic. Mm. I, I once had the pleasure of um, hearing from an Indigenous woman in Brisbane whose name I've forgotten about, she was reflecting on the peace movement from an Indigenous perspective. And she said that one of the things that's off-putting is that um, peace is treated as a noun in um, English, but it, it's actually a verb in the language of her community, which I'm not sure if she was a Yag or a woman, the Brisbane um, or from another group, but she said um, peace building makes sense, but peace doesn't make sense because mm -hmm. we always have, we are always either building peace or building conflict. And this yeah. is my summary. And I hope I'm doing justice to it. And so I feel as though when we think about, um, you know, the point of connection across generations, across cultures, across lands, um, it's about action and verbs and building and making um, mm -hmm. and not about a state that we will reach and then we'll be done. Yeah. Congratulations. We made it. <laughs> That's right. It's the process. Yeah. Just um, one say that uh, Peter's uh, email signature says peace is a verb. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Well, that's right. Yeah. Um, so in these last six minutes, because I know that James quite rightly is very focused on punctuality, I <laughs> want to um, firstly encourage everyone to put their contact info in if they would like. Um, I'm happy to be emailed and I'll just put mine in as well after I finish speaking. And I'm happy to share these resources, the slides. I'm happy for you to use them. Um, but what the action that I'm hoping that you will do is to really intentionally think with the groups about um, doing something to reach a new audience or to address a new goal. Because as you folks know, firstly, sometimes it's very generative and you realize, yes, you know, Psychologist for Peace has a wonderful book called Wise Ways to Win. I think we have gazillions of copies. Maybe we don't anymore. I'm not sure. We could easily um, email, we could easily send hundreds of copies of those to new parents. And uh, why not? You know, um, and we could fundraise to do that. Or, you know, looking at a new audience like prisoners or the police, you know, what are people doing? Oftentimes it's about reaching out to new groups, as Paloma highlighted. So if we're working with prisoners, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel and expose ourselves to all sorts of ignorance, um, you know, connecting with groups that work with prisoners and say, what do you do on peace? We're very interested in building a collaboration that has the, the twin function of growing the coalition of peace actors, but also, um, you know, educating ourselves and accessing the networks of other groups. And of course, the same thing is true when we think of um, working in the indigenous space rather than individually um, approaching people from a state of ignorance as in reinventing the wheel, working with the many indigenous groups that are interested in these issues 
and um, learning and sharing and building together. So um, all sorts of of uh, fruitful collaborations become possible and it doesn't have to be the only thing that you do but if you did it once in the year and then you look back um and every year we did that then i hope in the, that in you know another 10 years we would actually have more young people in the room <laughs> and we would have um who else did we say we'd have young parents in the room and we'd have um, prisoners and police in the room and um people building a peace movement that is engaged in these causes that's my vision um but of course feel, please feel free to do what you already have done and um i want to also do a special call out to the spotify list was it you margaret um of 300 peace songs that um margaret knows that she's going to share and that uh, we're going to send around the peace movement and i'm imagining the spotify list that'll get longer and longer as it circulates around the world and then it'll be a thousand piece songs and 10,000. <laughs> I have absolutely no technical skills in that way. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. We need a collaboration. I'm, I'm, I'm volunteering, Margaret. We can have a Zoom. I will build your Spotify list if they are um, available on Spotify, which is, of course, a sinister corporate actor who may not have all the peace movement songs that we know. <laughs> um, okay. So we've got uh, two minutes. Can I just invite um, people to pop into the chat or to just say something they've learned um, in the last hour and a half, presuming there was something? Everyone's avoiding eye contact, always a little ominous. <laughs> so hopefully that means you're typing, right? <laughs> I think one thing that you've made very clear, Winifred, is the importance of reaching out to groups themselves instead of I think sometimes in peace activism, there's a lot of invitation to join already existing groups, but right. yeah, forging new groups of those often neglected demographics, I think is a very key um, thing. Absolutely. And of course, that's such an important point. And I, I, I want to affirm it and make it explicit, like in the same way that we have WILF, the Women's International Peace and Freedom Movement, League for Peace and Freedom because of the entrenched sexism, but also because of the unique circumstances, there's tremendous power in inviting groups to form. And it, it means that the safety issue, the trust issue is circumvented as opposed to inviting people to come into a group of others and then having all that laborious, bad vibes and ignorance. <laughs> so, um, yes. I think Elizabeth said that she loved sharing connections and possibilities that people are involved in. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. Oh. Yeah, the theory is not my strong point. This needs more study. Well, I love theory and, and I, I do study it, um, Maggie, but I would say, you know, 20 peace activists can study theory and come up with 21 perspectives. So <laughs> on practical matters, <laughs> there's nothing so practical as a good theory. <laughs> um, great, Diane um, saying, I like the analytic approach. Hope we could have a session on the process with AVP. Oh, absolutely. Of course, please feel free to run it yourself, Diane, but I'd also be willing to do it. And um, yeah, really value um, the ideas. I'm happy to give them away. Um, yeah. And um, I'm just going to assume that you guys are typing. Oh, thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I'll take that anytime, anytime. Yeah, no <laughs> yeah good. <laughs> really agree with Peter's point. Peace work is as constant as breathing. Yeah. And just repeating that great line from 20 years ago, if you're not building peace, you're probably building conflict. <laughs> um, okay, well, James, over to you. I uh, don't know if you want to draw our session to the close or... Um... Yeah, just very briefly. Um, I mean, it's... Uh, I mean, the, the, the power of this session is evident in the, the great reviews you're getting from some very seasoned campaigners there in the chat. Thank you. So uh, thank you for that. 